of girls talk about this and that Get familiar with blue and the charmed ones too Charm chats Hello! Hello! Welcome to Charm Chats! With Kendra! And Kat! And the blue. And the blue. And, and the, the sump pump! pump. <laughs> we are going to talk over the sump pump today. Uh-huh. The sump pump has been working very, very hard. There was another large, large, large puddle in here this week. Yeah. After a thunderstorm. Yeah, it rained a fortunately, lot. Fortunately, week. all this, all that got wet was like that box under the sawhorse that I put there that's covered in spider eggs <laughs> and our rug, which is now dry. Yes. And funny enough, I had kept meaning to talk to my coworker about like, hey, when you want your dehumidifier back. <laughs> and then this week happened. Like, so hey, you're not getting your dehumidifier back. No, right now. No, right now. But I guess we have. I guess like Permaseal had done the basement before, and so I, I, I guess there's a warranty yeah, on that kind of shit. Like, even though like I can see cracks in the foundation wall. Yeah, I don't know how that works into their plans. But don't know. The sump pump drain has been fixed, so that it's not gonna pool against the house anymore. That's good. And they connected the gutters to this drain. What a concept. I know. Yeah. Because otherwise, it was hilarious because Todd was over here to help clean up down here. So he bought a new shop vac. It's currently sitting over there, I think. Unless mm-hmm. they, yeah, it's sitting over there. Mm-hmm. It's real nice. Yeah. It's a real nice shop vac. I nice. texted Caitlin. And I'm like, I'm so jealous. And then I realized it was staying here. And I'm like, I'm not jealous anymore. <laughs> nice. But yeah, he was cleaning up, and then he was going to just go, but the way he'd set up the drain, our old hose wasn't long enough to get to the point where the lot slopes down to the street, Mm -hmm. so it was on the driveway, and it was basically going sideways, and then down the little slope, and pulling against that railroad tie thing. Mm -hmm. And so the neighbor comes out as he's pulling out of the driveway, and he's like, hey, hey, (laughs) we gotta talk. You can't keep doing this. I got three pumps going. I'm just like, told you. Yeah. So he came back with a longer contiguous pipe. Yeah. That that works and doesn't leak all the all the fucking time. Good. Very very good. Yeah. It's like it's like I understand that. I'm going to get more stuff. I'll be back. Oh, he no, wasn't he about wasn't. to. No. No, he wasn't. I'm sure he wasn't. But no, no. But he did, and he came back. Yeah. And now we're good. Good. We should be good for a long time. Good. And hopefully we won't get any more oceans in here. Just puddles. Because, okay, like, the thing was, every time I've talked to Kaylin about talking to her dad about the water problem, she's been like, yeah, he says that's been happening since he was a kid. And then I show him photos of what was happening a couple days ago. I'm like, it's pretty much a small lake. This is not going to dry up in a day or two. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, that's a lot larger than we used to have as a kid. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I know. The three inch thing was much larger too. Yeah. Because we live in a fucking marsh. Yep. And I'm not talking the supermarket. It's a supermarket chain. Trust me. Oh, okay. It's definitely in Indianapolis. I think it's more yeah, south. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I have never lived anywhere but Illinois. Mm-hmm. Yeah, here we have Jewel. We have Kroger. We have Mariano's. We have... We don't really have Kroger. We have... We have there's Kroger in Illinois. There's owned by Kroger. No, there's, Kro- there's Kroger's in Illinois. Mm. Yeah, there is. Peoria. Okay, so let me rephrase my earlier statement. I have never lived anywhere except in the suburbs of Chicago. That's fair. Okay. <laughs> I have lived in many a suburb of Chicago, but I have never lived anywhere except the suburbs of Chicago. No, it, the whole... And the only reason that I know Piggly Wiggly exists is because <laughs> I spent summers in Wisconsin. There you go. There you go. So, Starbucks. Too. Yeah, the localization of all of the things all of intrigues the things. me. Grocery stores, like convenience chains Mm -hmm. whether or not you say pop soda whatever coke that's such a southern thing and i want to know how that started and i'm not gonna look it up because if i do i will go off for like three hours just randomly reading Mm -hmm. stuff and there's enough there's gonna be enough wiki tangenting in this episode Mm -hmm. to last a while yeah fast food chains yeah the difference between carl's jr and hardy's they're the same fucking place Mm mm-hmm same place. And they're both owned by Steven Universe. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> oh, and also, whether or not you say you, y'all, use guys. See, there's a funny thing with that. I... Apparently, use guys is real specifically located in, like, yes. Brooklyn or something. Yeah. That's... Yeah. Or Queens, probably. Mm, yeah, I don't know. But I, again, 
never lived anywhere besides the suburbs of Chicago. And I've only lived in Indianapolis besides. And I say y'all. I do too. Mm Mm-hmm. And I don't, it just, it feels nice. But I'm also weird because I UKify things. I spell color and favorite mm-hmm. and humor. I spell yeah, those I with a U. You that too. So, like, you know. Which really actually is kind of inauthentic. Well, yeah, they because, added the U. Yeah, I know. Yeah, they added the U. But that's not the point. The point is that I lovingly say that I'm, I'm an Anglophile and, and I, I love many things British. I never would have known based on the <laughs> Doctor Who sweater you're wearing. Yes. But. It's really funny because I was talking with somebody and they were looking at the way that I spell things and they literally were like, are you Canadian? Uh, I mean, are you? I am not. But apparently because I only anglophile certain things. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Blue. Because I only change like certain things. It is more Canadian than it is British. Because <laughs> I still like I still spell things like curb. I spell the American way. Mm-hmm. I, se- I spell that C-U-R-B. I do not spell it K-E-R-B because no. <laughs> and I spell tire with an I, not a Y. I spell pajamas with an A, not a Y. You know. I just say PJs. Well, yeah. but So there are still some things that, that I do not spell the British way. Bananas in pajamas. Yeah, we're not going there. Anyway, we're like eight minutes in and yeah. haven't even started this episode. It's so, like the old days. Yeah. So let's start this episode. We are on episode 209. Ms. Hellfire. Yes. This one aired on Thursday, January 13th, 2000. The only reason I bring up Thursday is because this episode is supposed to take place on a Friday. Oops. On a Friday the 13th, to be exact. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. But it aired on Thursday. At least it aired on the 13th. Yeah. It aired on Thursday the 13th, which is That's actually, that's a hell of a lot better than they got last year. So true. I say last year. I mean last season. Yes. So true. So, so true. Mm Mm-hmm. So. (laughs) Okay. So, sorry. I was just thinking, Ms. At one point in my life, I legitimately thought that denoted a woman who had been divorced. No, I didn't put this in my notes, but there's a YouTube channel called Today I Learned. Mm -hmm. They actually did a video on why Mrs. and Mr., like why Mrs. has an R in it. And it's because Mr. started out as Master Mm -hmm. and it changed over the years. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. started as Mistress. Yeah. Which is the opposite of Master. Yeah. But when Mistress took on the connotation that it has now, Mm -hmm. they changed the word to be Mrs. But here's the problem. (laughs) There's Mrs. and there's Miss. Yeah. And this is why Ms. came into into being, the MS period as a thing, is that if you didn't know, because Mrs., M-R-S, Mm -hmm. is for a woman who's married. You're right. And M-I-S-S, Miss, is for a woman who's not. But if you yeah. don't know if they're married or not, what do you call them? You don't want to be inappropriate. That's why they came up with Ms. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there you go. And now we're in a world where ma'am means you're old. Yeah, it used to be a sign of respect. And now you just look at it and go, please don't call me that. So tell us, what anyway. else is interesting about Hellfire? Well, other than, you know, it burns. Well, b- before we get to that, hold on. So, uh, the the title of Ms. Hellfire, the Wikia, the Charmed Wikia, says that it's in reference to the 1993 Robin Williams movie Mrs. Doubtfire, but I doubt that. No pun intended. Ha, ha, Puns ha, just happen. Ha, ha. Yeah, but like I don't, ha. I don't think that Ms. Hellfire is a reference to Mrs. Doubtfire. I really don't. I don't think so either. I mean, honestly, it's a some bit of, of a these... stretch. Yeah. Anyway, so the name Hellfire itself, there actually is a thing called Hellfire. It is a multi-platform, multi-target United States Army modular missile system. Mm-hmm. The name comes from the fact that it was originally intended to be a helicopter-launched fire-and-forget weapon. So it stands for Helicopter Fire and Forget. So you get to set it and forget it? Apparently. (laughs) Was Ron Papil on the uh, committee? (laughs) For those of you who don't know, and maybe weren't as into infomercials as either Kat or I was in our youth, (laughs) uh, 
You Ron, want an insomniac for many hours during the night. Ron Papil is an inventor and a marketing dude. Yep. And he's super fucking famous for this company he made called Ronco. Yep. Because it's Ron's company, I guess. Yep. And there's something called the Showtime Rotisserie. Yes. For which the tagline is, set, set it, it and, and forget, forget it. it. And yeah. he would always, like, put, you know, a chicken or sausage or lamb mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah, it was usually this a chicken, thing. yeah. And he would turn it on and he would say, set it. And the entire audience would go, and, and forget, forget it. it. Yeah. Uh-huh. And he is also, dear God, he is also the reason that we have, but wait, there's more. Which Billy Mays super capitalized on. Yes. I miss Billy Mays. I do too. I think Ron's still alive, isn't he? Yeah. Yes. Ron is mm. still alive. And he's been on TV since the 50s. Oh, yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, he started in like his uh-huh. 20s. It was crazy. Mm. And weirder still, Ronco is not only responsible for the Showtime rotisserie, it's apparently also responsible for the suffix omatic. Yep. Yeah, like the chop o and the dial o and the Ugh. veg o Yeah. Ooh, Inside the Shell Egg Scrambler? Yeah. Ooh. Oh, wait, I think... Hang on. Didn't we watch that one video of the dude with the golden egg thing? Yeah. Is it like that? Yeah, kind of. I think okay. so. Okay. Basically, it's this... Uh, You put an egg in this little, like, cradly thingy, and there's two strings, and you, like, twist it around and then pull it so that... Yeah, you make it into a fe- centrifuge. Yeah. Is literally what you're doing. You are making oh. it into a centrifuge. So it scrambles the uh, egg inside the shell. Yep. And then you can hard boil it. Yep. Oh, man. they. Didn't... Or you can crack it open and it's already mixed for you and make your scrambled eggs. Oh, I think I remember the knives. I had the smokeless ashtray. Smokeless ashtray. Oh, okay. Fan. Yeah. Yeah. It's literally... The smokeless ashtray is literally just an ashtray with a fan at the bottom that pulls the smoke into the ashtray. It's mm-hmm. so that when you're smoking, when you put the cigarette into the ashtray, it keeps the smoke there as opposed to it going everywhere. And possibly my favorite name of any invention I've yet seen, the cap snaffler. Yeah, it's a bottle opener. They don't even say it opens. They say it snaffles, snaffles. caps off of any size jug, bottle, or jar. And it really, really works. Snaffles it caught on even less than fetch, apparently. <laughs> yes. Okay. Indeed. Oh, man. Okay. Infomercials, baby. You gotta love them. That and what was the, the one gym thing? The iron bow or whatever? There was another infomercial for some kind of gym equipment that had these, like, different tensile rods that you bend back. Oh, the Bowflex. Bowflex, yeah. See? I knew you would know what I was talking about. You're like the iron bow, and I'm like, the fuck is the iron I've bow? I've been watching Iron Fist. Sometimes my brain gets mixed up. That's fine. We're gonna put links to Ron Pupil. Ronco. And trust me, and, it's and said even, that way. Yes, it um, is. Ronco and Billy Mays. Yeah. Because everyone should know about Billy Mays. Yes. I miss Billy Mays. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. Every time I look at a thing of OxyClean. Yeah. What's the what's the thing that I have at my house besides OxyClean? ShamWow? No, ShamWow is the ShamWow guy. I know. It's Vince the ShamWow guy, and I don't. Did he take over for Billy Mays? No. Who, didn't someone, like, no, kind no, of no, take no, over no. for Billy That's Mays? The, that was the other guy, Anthony Sullivan. Ooh. I'll put his link on the website as well. The weird bendy straws thing that someone parodied? Yes. Oh my god, yeah. What were those called? Something noodle. I can't remember. Oh yeah. Banoodle! Banoodle. There you go. Okay, so, just because I'm me and we mentioned OxyClean, I'll put that in there as well. Because OxyClean is amazing stuff. Like, it's really, really funny. Like, you wouldn't think that OxyClean would be a big deal, and yet... Mm-hmm. OxyClean is amazing. Well, you know, some of these infomercial things really, really work. They really, really do. In the way that you want them to. Yeah, they really, really do. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... Like, the Snuggie actually works. Yeah, well, It looks and, a little ridiculous, but it's, it's well, not made for, like... That's the other thing, is, like, a lot of infomercial products are not made for able-bodied people. Mm-hmm. They are sold to able-bodied people so that they can actually make enough money to Give have, them. have them gotten to the people who actually need them. Like the mm-hmm. Snuggie. Yeah. The Snuggie was made for people in wheelchairs. Yeah. And the only way that they could make sure that people in wheelchairs could actually, you know, get the Snuggie when they need it was is to have to have Was pink and blue family campers. Yeah. Who were just dancing around on, like, their little foldy chairs and shit. Yeah. 
Yeah, all the, all of these infomercial products they do with the white people messing shit up filter. Yeah, I say filter. Really, it's just it's you know, a meme now. All of the it's black and white. <laughs> yeah, what's the what's the one game you just yell infomercial and you have to like fuck Drop, up whatever? Yeah, you're you doing. have to fuck up whatever you're doing. <laughs> it's, it's a fun game, especially when you're in a room full of drunk people. That's great. Uh huh. That or the Star Trek like yes. Kirk. Yeah, just yell Kirk it. Or whatever. Yeah. Shatnerize it. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's mostly a vocal affectation. Indeed. That wasn't a very good Shatner impression. No, but that's okay. Uh, It's been a while since I've listened to him. That's okay. Anyway, so let's get into this episode now that we've uh, tangented for like 20-something minutes. Yes, let's. I don't know how much. Oh, people love our tangents. Oh, well, yes, but you know. I mean. that one person. Mm. (laughs) I don't. No, no, no. They didn't. They didn't say they didn't love our tangents. They just said we don't appear to love the show very much. We're very oh, wait, overcritical. No, what was it? What was it? No. I'm not feeling, feeling the, the love. love. Yeah. Yeah. Someone left a two-star review for Back us. Back in, like, January. Yeah. Yeah, which is fine. Like, you know, if you don't like it, you don't like it. But it was a criticism I've heard about a lot of podcasts. So I guess that puts us in a pretty good position. And I'm okay with it. Where they're like... You're doing a podcast about a show, but it doesn't seem like you really love it. Honey, if we didn't love the show, we wouldn't do the podcast. So true. Also, the first season is fucking bonkers. It really, really is. Okay, it's not bonkers. It's bananas. Bonkers is a positive connotation for me. Well, all right then. It's a completely just 90s TV show... Yeah. Daytime television, primetime or whatever. Yeah, I think it was primetime. Yeah, primetime. But it's not... And then later it was primetime in the daytime. Well, yes. Yes. We love the show, Mm -hmm. but we know how bad the show could be. Like... We're not gonna we're not gonna sugarcoat and say we love all of this horrible writing, because honestly... Yeah, we love every continuity error. No, I'm sorry. No. No. (laughs) We, we are not here to say, yes, we love this show, here's everything amazing about it, and forget all the bad stuff. Mm-hmm. We are here to basically, if you've never, thank you, Blue, if you've never seen the show before, you can listen to this podcast and you, you will have, have watched watch the, the show. show. Yeah. Like, if you have never seen it before, you can listen to this podcast and you will have basically watched it. Uh-huh. And that's the best part. Yeah. And I will... Once again, apologize for there not being pictures up on the website. I'm Yeah, cat, what's with that? I'm trying, but timing of life of having to rewatch the episode to take the pictures mm-hmm. is not working out for me so well. But I will try very hard to have them up before the end of the season. Mm-hmm. And if between seasons we have to take a little bit of extra time off so that I can just rewatch the episodes and take pictures and have all the pictures up before the third season starts, mm-hmm. then that's what's going to happen. That's um, fair. Because I realized as I was going through the website, I realized that we started out with no pictures and then it was like two or three pictures and then like four or five pictures and then like 15 pictures and then 30 pictures and then it got up to a hundred pictures. Why? Why do you do this to yourself? I don't know why I do this to myself. What episode was it a hundred pictures for? The last episode that we have pictures up was a hundred pictures. Which is, I don't know at this point. I want to say it's 201. Okay. The very first episode. to be fair, that was a very image reference heavy episode yeah it was very very image heavy reference wise Mm -hmm. because we also had to spend a lot of time looking at whether or not there were boxes and wardrobes yeah and who the fuck that was playing nicholas yeah but i think it for me it's also the fact of i don't watch on netflix and take screenshots Mm -hmm. i'm literally watching on my tv and taking pictures with my phone and then cutting down those pictures so that you can't see all of the random crap around my television so it's not just take a picture, throw it up. It really does take a lot more time than you'd think. But I want to take these pictures so that you have a reference. Take a picture, throw it up. All day long, you'll have good luck. Maybe. Just don't throw up on my pictures. Anyway. Well, you're the one who's going to be throwing them up. Yes. Indeed. Anyway, so let's actually get into the show, shall we? Because we're going to tangent right off the bat. I oh, know yeah. It. So let's get into it. So immediately we start out... Inside the manor. I think this might be the first time that we haven't had a single exterior shot at the beginning, but I could be wrong. Uh, I mean, maybe not, but there's also relatively not that many episodes, so... True, but I think... But I'm fairly It's entirely possible that this could be the first one. Yeah, I'm fairly certain that it's the first one. But again, you know, it's been a while since we started, and I don't go back and listen to things after I edit them. So if we did start out in some other episode 
where we were immediately inside, let me know. Send mm-hmm. me an email, send me a tweet, something, let me know. Yeah. Anyway, so we see Prue on the phone, and we see Phoebe sitting at the table eating her breakfast of honey nut toasted oats. Mm. I love that the box has, like, this lovely little cartoon bear sticking his finger into a beehive. It was a funny image. Aw. It's a very funny image to me. So Prue is wearing black pants. Thank you, Blue. A big blue side. Uh-huh. And a shiny blackish blue corset top with exposed bra cups. It was very, very Fredericks of Hollywood. Uh, I'll take your word for it. And she's also wearing a necklace that is a very large pearl. Mm-hmm. It was kind of interesting. So I used to shop at Fredericks of Hollywood back when I could still fit into their outfits. So, yeah. I got a corset thing from Fredericks of Hollywood. It barely fit me. It was not an actual corset in yeah. any way, shape, or form. But Fredericks of Hollywood was a well-known retailer of women's lingerie mm-hmm. and other sundry items. It was started by Frederick Millinger in 1947 in Hollywood, California, on of Hollywood course. Boulevard. Fredericks of Hollywood sold bras and panties and corsets and bedroom slippers and a vast array of hosiery and all sorts of different stuff. They were the market leader in lingerie until the 80s when they were overtaken by Victoria's Secret, which we are all sad about. I'm not a fan of Victoria's Secret because they don't go up to my size in bra. And whenever I walk in there, like even if I'm not going for me, if I'm going with somebody else who can fit into their stuff, they always give me that little look of like, we have nothing for you. Why are you here? And it annoys me. Mm Mm-hmm. I understand that I'm a plus size woman. I understand that I have a large chest and I hate it when I walk into a clothing store that I know that I don't fit into anything in that store and they treat me like I'm an alien from another planet and they don't understand why I exist. Mm -hmm. But no, what I was going to say about Fredericks of Hollywood, if we go back to finish out my tangent on that, (laughs) was that Frederick Millinger also invented the push-up bra, which is one of like 40 different types of bras there are. You wouldn't know it if you go to, like, your average cold, because it seems like half of everything is push-up. Well. And, like, above a C? Why? (laughs) We got enough boob. Just place it better. Yeah, well, there is that. But I will actually put a link to the Wikipedia for the list of brassiere designs, because Mm. it is just an interesting read to see all of the different kinds of art. Does it include, like, with historical context? Because, like, you know, before they could do the molded cups, they had the spiral thing. I honestly don't know. It was one of those where... That's where, you get, that's where you get your, like, cone bras from the 50s. There is a picture of Patty Page wearing the bullet bra. Oh, it's called a bullet, bullet bra. bra. Okay. Yeah, from 1955 mm-hmm. on that Wikipedia page. But yeah, there there are many, many different types of bras. And so I will put that link on the website just because it's an interesting read. Mm-hmm. But, so, Fredericks of Hollywood, if we are going to finish out this tangent and then continue with the show, they declared bankruptcy in 2015, closed 93 of their retail stores... The brand was then acquired by Authentic Brands Group and was relaunched as an online-only store. Such a generic name, too. Well, you know, whatever. So I will put a link to the website for anyone who wants to check that out. It is just fredericks.com. F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K-S dot com. Frederick. And for any Hannah Hart fans out there, yes, I Hmm. think it, too. Okay, so, back to the show. I understood that reference. You did? Vaguely. Yeah. I love Hannah Hart I so much. I have a certificate of e-marriage to her from yeah? the tour. That's awesome. It's somewhere in all my stuff over there. I don't think I have that, but I have, somewhere I have a picture of me with her, and she had to be on tiptoes, and she still didn't come up to my shoulder. It was mm-hmm. very funny. Or, well, she came up, like, barely to my shoulder. But I love Hannah Hart so much that my Minecraft skin is a carrot onesie. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so back to the show, Phoebe, sitting there eating her Honey Nut Toasted O's, is wearing green pants that are kind of loose-fitting, and a three-fourth sleeve red top that has an interesting pattern on it, but it's kind of hard to describe. So when the pictures are up, eventually you'll see it. Sorry about that. And it's kind of pulled up at the bottom in like a stylistic way and it's showing off her belly button ring Mm. which she has now shown off the past couple of episodes and her hair is in two braids one on either side of her head and she is wearing a very elaborate necklace 
Prue, who is on the phone, talking to her assistant, Monique, about her schedule for the day. And Phoebe reminds her about Tybo class. So Prue tries to shift her schedule around to accommodate this. Now, once again, we are going to tangent right off the bat. If anyone does not know, Tybo is a total body fitness system that incorporates martial arts techniques such as kicks and punches, and it became very, very popular in the 90s. It was developed by American Taekwondo practitioner Billy Blanks and was one of the first cardio boxing programs to enjoy commercial success. The name Taibo is a portmanteau of Taekwondo and boxing. Yes. Yes. Furthermore, it, it is, is a, a backronym. backronym. Yeah. That's a word? It is indeed. I will tell you backronym in a second. So the backronym is total commitment to whatever you do, awareness of yourself and the world, excellence, the truest goal in anything you do, body as a force for total change, obedience to your will and your true desire for change. Spelling ah. out Tybo. So most people know what an acronym is, a word derived from the initial letters of words of a phrase. For example, the word radar comes from radio detection and ranging. Mm -hmm. Okay. By contrast, a backronym is constructed by creating a new phrase to fit an already existing word name mm -hmm. or acronym. For example, the United States Department of Justice assigns their Amber Alert program the meaning of America's Missing Broadcast Emergency Response, though the term Amber Alert came about because of Amber Hagerman, the nine-year-old who was abducted and murdered in Texas back in 1996. So I will put a link to both of those on the website in case anyone wants to read about that because it yeah. was, it's a sad case, but it was an interesting read. And of course, I will put links to Tybo and Backronym because why wouldn't I? Okay. So Prue's cell phone rings and Phoebe goes to get it for her and <laughs> Prue realizes that Tybo just isn't going to happen today. No. Nope. Prue thinks that the call that is coming in is going to be Jack, but it turns out to be the new VP, Mr. Caldwell. Prue then asks Monique why Mr. Caldwell is calling her at home, but Mr. Caldwell is calling her cell phone and she's talking to Monique on the house phone. Mm -hmm. So. Well, he probably knows she's at home. But that's not the point. True. He's calling her on her cell phone. Probably because you couldn't get a hold of the home phone, too. Yeah, I don't know about that. But anyway, there's apparently a 9.30 emergency staff meeting that she has to be at or she'll be fired. So Phoebe and Prue both hang up their respective phones. Phoebe jokes that she's tired and needs a nap. <laughs> Draw that work. Uh-huh. And Prue quips that she needs another her because she doesn't even have time to have fun anymore. No. Yeah, poor And this baby. is when Piper walks in carrying a bag. Mm -hmm. She's wearing a long sleeve green shirt. There's white trim on the collar. And on the shoulders. Yeah. And black pants. Prue and Phoebe turn to each other and they start talking about, who is this person walking into our kitchen? Didn't we have a sister? Yeah. What was her name? Pippi. Pipper. Pipper. Yeah. Because apparently Piper has been spending all of her time at Dan's place next mm -hmm. door. Because her life has been so nice and calm and normal for the first time in months. And then she goes to ruin that, even though Phoebe tries to stop her. By saying that she doesn't even care that it's Friday the 13th. Oh, Piper. Mm -hmm. Piper, Piper, Piper. Don't jinx it. Yep. Too late. Too late. And because this is, suddenly... This is when someone starts shooting through the windows of the house by the, like, solarium and shit. Yeah, they're shooting through the lovely stained glass window in the conservatory, the wicker room, whatever we're calling it mm -hmm. these days. Solarium. Mm. And so everyone starts screaming and... Prue and Phoebe run past the dining room into the living room. Mm -hmm. And they dive behind the couch. Which isn't going to stop shit, but yeah. at least it's harder to tell where they are. I guess. Piper stays on the other side of the room. Where and she's then, guarded by an actual wall. Yeah. And then Phoebe tells Piper to join them behind the sofa. And, like, after a little bit of, like, not wanting to, I love the, the little moment of, of Phoebe's just like, get over here. Mm -hmm. It was very funny. So Piper Piper starts running, and then more bullets are flying, so she freezes them. And this is one of the new credit scenes for this season. Mm -hmm. Where she freezes the bullets in midair as they go through the vase on the table. Yeah. And I thought it was very funny, and I didn't notice it until I had to rewind a little, and, and I was watching it again. As she's running past, she knocks one of the chairs. Yeah. Just a tiny bit, and it just moves just the tiniest bit. It was just funny to me. I don't know. I thought it was mm -hmm. funny. 
But so she she runs through the dining room. She hides behind the couch with her sisters. And a bullet hits one of the pillows on the couch. And it's just an all-out convenience that it doesn't go through the couch and hit any of them. Because a couch is not Kevlar. Yeah. Like, there is no reason why bullets coming through hitting that couch should not have gone straight through that couch and into them. Mm -hmm. Couch might stop an arrow. mm, Might. Maybe. It'll stop some of the flimsier ones. But it's not going to stop a bullet. Yeah. So, again, unless you decided to make your couch out of Kevlar. Which, hey, you know, props to you for foresight. Indeed. But the props department did not have that kind of foresight. They did not. But now the question is, do we count the couch as part of the furniture annihilation quotient? It wasn't really annihilated. It was just kind no, of No, but they're going to have to get a new one. I'd count it. Yeah? I mean, when I made the FAQ, I was thinking, you know, smashy smash kind of deals. Okay. But, you know, this, it gets shot up. So even though they never make a deal about having to get a new one, which I can't really remember anyone making a deal of having to get a new, like, table or whatever, you know, might as well count it. Okay. So then that brings our furniture annihilation quotient up to 13 for the season and 18 for the series. So the bullets stop. Mm -hmm. Someone peeks over the top of the couch. Bullets start up again. They duck back down. And Prue's complaining about the whole timing thing. Yeah, she's like, I I can't deal with this today. Mm -hmm. You know, and then they stop shooting again. Phoebe wonders when demons started using bullets. Which, you know, is a good thought. Uh Piper's like, well, maybe it's not a demon. And Prue's like, who else wants to kill us? Yeah. Which is a fair point. It truly is. Because, let's face it, the demons and the warlocks are their biggest enemies right now. They haven't had time to make many more. Indeed. Other than possibly bosses. Well, yeah. But Phoebe jokes that Prue was a little sharp to the mailman. <laughs> we all know how testy they can be, which is a quote-unquote joke. And I am using air quotes here because it's not funny. It started in 1986 in Edmond, Oklahoma, during a deadly rampage that lasted less than 15 minutes Postal worker Patrick Shirrell pursued and shot 20 co-workers, killing 14 of them before he committed suicide. His attack inspired the phrase, going postal, which, contrary to popular belief, if you watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine, does not have a happy connotation. No, it does not. It means becoming extremely and uncontrollably angry, often to the point of violence, usually in a workplace environment. So... The phrase going postal is not yeah, a funny thing. It's not a happy bunny. It is not. Though happy bunny wasn't happy either. This is true. Yeah. It's happy bunny. Anyway, between 1986, with that first shooting, and 1997, more than 40 people were killed by current or former employees and at least 20 different incidents of workplace rage. Mm-hmm. And I know that there was at least a couple of incidents in 2006. So it's not like it's ended. No. It's just... No, and, and yeah. it's it's actually shifted a bit younger, I think. Well, now, now, we, have, now we have more shootings. school shootings, yeah. Because yeah. 99 kind of kicked that off. Well, yeah, we're not going to go there. Yeah. Anyway, so back to the show. <laughs> they hear the doorknob on the front door rattling a bit. So they make the plan to freeze, kick, and send flying whoever comes through the door. And then everything goes silent, and we get lovely little push-ins on the door as they wait for it to open. And then a woman comes out into the dining room from the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I want to know how she managed that, rattling the front door while somehow already being at the back door. No, I think it was more she rattled the front door for just a moment and then ran around to the back. because That was too fast. Well, but here's the thing. If you actually look at the way that the door was, normally when you when they show us the front door, if somebody's standing outside the front door, you can see a shadow of somebody standing there. Mm-hmm. When that door rattled, you couldn't see a shadow. Yeah, so I want to know how she did that. So maybe she like tied a string to it or something? That could work. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't really matter because timing in this episode timing is a little off. Timing in this show is well, a yes. little off. Yeah, so timing in this episode isn't exact. Anyway. So this woman that comes in has a short red bob for a haircut. It looked a little bit like a wig. It yeah, probably I think was. It was a wig. Yep. And she is wearing black pleather pants. Got to love that mm-hmm. plastic leather. That's what pleather stands for. Yep. Over a long sleeve shirt that has black fabric arms and a black pleather lace up bust. Again, it was very Fredericks of Hollywood. <laughs> like super duper. 
Anyway, she also has a necklace that looks like silver pearls, and she is holding a very large gun and seems to have a backpack full of bullets on her back. Mm -hmm. She shoots at them, but Prue holds up her hand and uses her power to deflect the bullets Mm -hmm. and fling them back at the woman, who naturally fucking Mm -hmm. bites the bullet, literally. Yeah. Um, Well, Well, not literally. No. No, She's no teller. (laughs) Yes. The girls run over, and sure enough, she's dead and bleeding on the floor. Yep. And so Prue's like, well, that wasn't a demon. Yeah, Prue is not excited about the fact that it wasn't a demon. No, they no. were not expecting a human who could be shot by bullets. Yeah. And die. Yeah, they definitely were not expecting that. And she makes the realization that it wasn't a demon, and we go to the opening credits. Mm-hmm. Because that's how we do in this show. Now, even though this woman who comes in has no lines... And no actual name. And no actual name that we are aware of. And she was... She was in all of, like, 20 seconds. Right. And on IMDb, she was listed as uncredited, which I also thought was interesting. According to the wikia and the uncreditedness on IMDb, the actress's name is Wendy Bromley, and that's Wendy with an I... She is an occasional actress, but she is mostly a stunt woman. And she has worked as a stunt double for Shannon Doherty in an unknown number of episodes. So On this show? On this show. Oh, nice. So it's kind of apropos that she gets to play this part. And she has also been a stunt double for, again, this is according to the wikia, Michelle Trachtenberg and other people on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Mm. Terry Hatcher and Eva Longoria on Desperate Housewives. You wouldn't think they need stunt doubles on that show. Oh, did you not watch that show? Because I watched that show. Okay. Apparently I'm wrong. Yes. It's also really interesting, though, because... Okay, so she also did for Miley Cyrus, too. And... You know... Miley Cyrus and others on Hannah Montana. That's the question. It's like, who else on Hannah Montana? See, that is very interesting to me, because... When I think about body types, like, sure, you know, all of these people are skinny women, Mm -hmm. but I don't consider Terry Hatcher and Eva Longoria... To be the same body type? No, they're not. No, to be the same body type as Michelle Trachtenberg and Miley Cyrus. Yeah. No. Like, what? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, no. So, that, I don't know, maybe they really are just that short, and you never know until you see see them in person. But see, here's the thing. Stunt doubles don't have to be the same height. Oh, they don't. Because as long as whoever they're fighting against is the same height relatively, oh, yeah. that's all yeah, that matters. That sense. So, like, you and I could go, you know, have a, have a little fight, whatever, and as long as our stunt doubles were relatively the same height, they could each be a foot taller than us, but as long as they were still a few inches apart in height between the two, hmm. it doesn't matter. That's fair. Because it's not, you, you don't have to be like, oh, I have to find someone who's, you know, five foot whatever, to fight this other person who's five foot whatever. It's like, no, they can both be six something as long as they're still... How tall are you? Mm, You're five, five three. Five three, and I'm five six. So as long as they're still three inches apart in height, then it doesn't matter how tall they are. Cool. That's good to know. Yeah. Anyway, so our post credit song on the DVD is Still After You by a band called Earth to Andy. I remember them. I do not. They were an American alternative rock band from Charlottesville, Virginia. They were founded in 1997. The song Still After You was their lead single. It was a rock radio hit, reaching number 39 on the Billboard Mainstream Rock Charts. But in June of 2011, their guitarist, Tony Lapasinski, died after an 18-month battle with cancer. So this is, I'm assuming, when the band broke up, but there's mm-hmm. no real information about that on their wiki. So, don't know. The post credit song on Netflix, thanks to Shazam, hashtag not sponsored, is Keep Running by the band Unrated. Now, I was able to find the album on allmusic.com, but the preview of the song there doesn't really give any lyrics. So after a little more searching, I was able to find it on tunefind.com, and that actually has other songs from the show as well. So I'll put links to both of those on the website. But I couldn't really find anything out about the band because a Google search for unrated doesn't really narrow things down. No. Though I did find a YouTube for unrated band site that only has six videos on it. All of the videos are from like seven or eight years ago, and they're basically all just cover songs with no singing. And the band seems to be high school boys. So not really sure if it's the same band. Though I did listen to their cover of Fat Lip, and they're actually not too bad. 
So for shits and giggles, I'll link to them on the website. Back to the show, we have a shot of the Oakland Bay Bridge in the background of buildings, including the Triangle Building, and then a shot of the buildings behind boats parked in the water. Then we get a quick shot of the Triangle Building that pans down to see a streetcar coming up the road, which brings our streetcar total to seven for the season and 35 total for the series. You're nine episodes in and we only have seven streetcars. That makes me sad. Me too, now that you mention it. Yeah. Aw. Streetcars. Where'd you go? Yeah. I mean, did you leave your tracks? No, not so much. But that's okay. We'll be fine. We then get a shot of cars going across the Golden Gate Bridge, and then a distant shot of the city behind the Golden Gate Bridge. And then we get another shot of the Triangle Building, and a quick shot of the Ghirardelli Building, and then a shot of that, like, domed building in the park with the water and the benches that we got last Uh, season. yeah. Yeah. Then we get a shot of the Golden Gate Bridge in the background of buildings before ending on a shot of the manor. This shot also shows neighbor Dan's house and an electrical pole in the foreground. It's a shot that we haven't had before. And we see that the two trees on the sidewalk are completely bare of leaves, but the tree next to their house and the flowers around it are thriving. Once it pans down to see the people walking by and the station wagons, we are back inside looking at the dead body of the pleather clad woman. Mm Mm-hmm. The girls are dumping out her purse on the dining room table. They start looking at all the things that were in it, including passports with multiple identities, foreign money, and throwing stars. Yeah. And then Prue picks up a lipstick and opens it up and winds it up, and a blade pops out and jokes that it's not exactly Avon calling. Now, for anyone who is not aware, Avon Products, Inc., is also known as Avon, is an American international manufacturer and direct selling company in beauty, household, and personal care categories. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that's a pyramid scheme that's not a pyramid scheme. Well, I'll get to that. Yeah, I know. The, The company was started way back in 1886. David H. McConnell was a struggling door to door salesman in New York, and in 1886, he decided to sell perfumes rather than books. Because perfume was easier to sell than books. In 1892, he changed the company name from whatever it had been to the California Perfume Company because his business partner lived in California. It was a whole big thing. At some point, they became Avon, but it's a little confusing as to when. I think it was in the 30s, but I'm not positive on that. Hmm. Anyway, their marketing slogan was Avon Calling... So I'll put a link to some Avon ads that appeared on TV in like the 60s, though I will give an epilepsy warning as the second ad does do a bit of flashing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was not prepared for it and it gave me a migraine and I do not have epilepsy. So I would just like to give that warning before anybody clicks on it. Anyway, Avon is the fifth largest beauty company and the second largest direct selling enterprise in the world second only to Amway. Mm -hmm. Now, where Avon is known as a multi-level marketing company, Amway is more known as a pyramid scheme, which is a phrase with a much more sinister connotation. Links on the website, of course. And if you want a really good in-depth analysis of what it means to be called a multi-level marketing company versus a pyramid scheme and how thin the line of distinction Mm -hmm. is, in fact, it's kind of a blur yeah, we'll um, John Oliver did a really good bit about it a few months ago, I want to say. I will put a link to that half an hour episode. Hey, if on they the listen website. to this, which is three no, hours, no, that's they fine. shouldn't have a problem with a half hour YouTube video. This is not three hours. This has never been three hours. Uh, I've always gotten it down to under three hours. It's been close, but it has never been three hours. I round up. Two hours, 47 minutes is the longest we've ever gone. Yep. That was season one. I'd round that up to three. Well, no one's going to say two and three quarters hours. Yes, Blue. Anyway. Mm. And an hour 20 minutes is the shortest we've ever been, and that was also in season one. Anyway. So, yeah. I will link to the John Oliver video on the website. But, yeah. There there is a very thin line between multi-level marketing and pyramid scheme, and it basically comes down to, are you lying or not? Is basically what it is. But that's way oversimplifying. Whatever. Mm. So the other things that we need to know about Avon. In 1989, 
Avon vowed that as a company located in the United States, they would no longer participate in animal testing. However, while this is still true about the cosmetics that are sold in the United States, the same cannot be said about their overseas products. Due to laws mandated by different countries, Avon is forced to test products like sunscreen, whitening products, and hair dye on animals if they want to sell those products in those countries, like, say, China. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But because Avon is not globally animal testing free, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, or PETA, has not included Avon on their cruelty-free list. Now, Mm. I am not a fan of PETA. Me neither. They started out good, but they have become a bit corrupt over time. Most recently, they have criticized the Nintendo Switch cow milking game for not being realistically cruel enough. Because they have nothing fucking better to do with their time. Yeah. Most of the revenue they get goes toward marketing. Yeah. Like Autism Speaks. Yeah, we're not going to go there. No, we're not going to go there. And Susan G. Komen. We're also not going to go there. Yeah. And they do a lot of weird, stupid, misogynistic shit. Well, yeah, they've done a lot of things. But the other thing that they have done that, again, and I I will link to these articles from PETA's website. They have literally said that you shouldn't eat cheese if you believe in women's rights because they have equated the cheese making process with domination, imprisonment, rape, kidnapping, and killing. And sure, the dairy industry has issues. However. However. I'm not going to get into an argument over who is right or wrong in this situation because I encourage you to read up on things and make your own decisions. Therefore, I will put links to everything on the website so you can read and decide for yourself. Mm -hmm. But I know that there have been articles of them like euthanizing like 81% of the pets that they do. But a lot of that stuff isn't from their own website. A lot of that Mm -hmm. is from... Well, they're not going to put those decisions up also. but like, Right, but I'm just saying a lot of those are from websites that are specifically against PETA. Mm-hmm. And therefore, I don't necessarily want to use those because I don't That's necessarily fair. know what their sources are. The two things that I mentioned are directly from PETA's website. So. Oh, yeah. And they also say that you shouldn't have pets, which is just like a weird thing. I did not find that as an article on their website, but yeah. There, there is a lot of things that they have done and said that I am not a fan of. But again, I will put I all the links up. I love how this tangent was about something. It was about Avon, and now we're just talking about oh, PETA. Well, you know, it happens. What is this malarkey? PETA malarkey. <laughs> Hunger Games refs. Hunger Games refs. Yes. You come for the show, you stay for the tangent. This it's, is true. You know, it's just the thing. Right, that Regina? <laughs> right, Susanna? <laughs> it's a thing that happens. Anyway, back to the show. Piper finds a key to the Sutro Heights apartments and thinks that it's scary that she lived so close to them. I looked it up. It's not a real place. I figured that. Yeah. Phoebe thinks that it's scarier that they've never been attacked by a mortal before. And Prue is like, I just killed a real person. Yeah, she is lamenting her first mortal kill. And Piper's like, Prue, this was a hit woman. She came to kill us. You acted in self-defense. She's not innocent. So don't feel so bad. Yeah. The reason that she knows that this woman wasn't so innocent is she found a list of 11 names. We are shown this list. Eventually there'll be a picture of it. And the only two names not crossed off of this list are M. Steadwell and And P. P. Halliwell. Halliwell. So Piper then flips through this little planner thing trying to figure out who hired this woman. And lands on a page that lists their powers. Phoebe is listed as negligible. negligible. Yeah, and that makes her sad. And she immediately develops a complex about it. Yeah. It's great. It was adorable. But Prue still doesn't understand why a demon would hire a mortal to kill them, which I don't understand either, but that's neither here nor there. And Piper's like, I, I wish I'd known that this was about, you know, supernatural stuff before I called Daryl. Yeah. With a perfect timing, Daryl then knocks on the door and walks in before Piper can even say his name and finish her sentence. He is wearing a dark brown suit with a greenish gray shirt and a patterned tie, and the suit looks a little bit too big on him. That's the style. Yeah, I know. I wish it wasn't. (laughs) So do I. Anyway, Prue thanks him for coming, but he's not sure that he wants to be there because they have the habit of not telling him the whole truth. How astute of you, Inspector Morris. (laughs) Inspector. Inspector Gadget. No. 
So they tell him about the hit woman coming to kill them. And then they show him the body and he questions them about it. And Prue says that it was self-defense. And he again questions how she's dead by gunshot if they never touched the gun. And Phoebe's like, do you really want to know? Which he does. And so he finally gets to learn that they're witches. Yay! Yay! He seems to take it much better than most. At least better than Andy did, though that was different circumstances. Mm -hmm. So they ask him to keep this death as quiet as possible for as long as possible while they figure out what demon is behind it. Because, you know, gotta still be a demon somehow, right? Mm -hmm. Piper hands him the planner when he asks for it. And he finds an entry for Plastique 10 a.m. along with the M. Studwell name. Now, Plastique is an obsolete term for plastic explosive. And he does say plastic explosive, mm-hmm. so he explains it. So it is a soft and hand-moldable solid form of explosive material. It's usually used within the field of explosive engineering. It's also known as putty explosives. It's usually used in, like, construction, stuff like that. Demolition. S- yeah, like demolition. It's a... Not the derby. No. The buildings. Correct. It's a solid way of blowing something up so that you know that it will blow up properly. Yes. Yes. Because it's very, it's very stable. Yeah. The most common one is C4. Mm-hmm. I think so. So that's usually when, when people think of plastic explosive, they think of C4. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not going to tangent on this, but there's apparently a DC comic supervillain named Plastique. So just for fun, I'll link that to the website too. In relation to Mystique? No. Just that's French different. names. Just French names. That's a different... Oh, but right. That's Shit. DC Marvel. Mystique is Marvel. Yeah, Mystique is Marvel. I always forget because X-Men aren't really included in the MCU. No, because they're their own thing, kind well, of. Well, because some other company owns them. Yeah. We're not going to get into DC Marvel at this point. Anyway. So, in the book, it said Plastique 10 a.m. So, Phoebe moves Piper's sleeve to look at Piper's watch. Mm-hmm. And sees that it's after 9 a.m. I love that since she doesn't have her own, she grabs her sister's arm to look Mm -hmm. at her watch. It's adorable. Daryl then says that he's going to check the DMV for an address, and Phoebe decides that she's going to go with him. Piper says that she and Prue will see about finding out what they can at this woman's apartment, and Prue says that they need to make a quick pit stop at Buckland's so that she won't lose her job. Mm Mm-hmm. Daryl says that he'll make a call to put the body on ice, but it'll only give them a maximum of one day to figure this all out. And he and Phoebe head toward the door. So then we jump. We get the sign for Bucklands. And we get to see Brown Suit Lady walk past with Red Umbrella Lady. And then Umbrella Briefcase walks by with Feathers in Her Hair Lady coming up behind him. And to round out our cast of extras, Tan Jacket Floral Skirt Lady walks by. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's a good episode. That's almost everyone. That is almost everyone. So we have all but the newest member of our extras team. Indeed. Oh, this is a really good episode. It's a good episode, right? Just for that alone, it's a good episode. I'm so proud. Oh, my God. It was great. It was wonderful. I'm so, so excited. yeah. Anyway. Cutting to inside. Yeah, inside. a bunch of people in a boardroom around a table. They're all, like, wearing... stuff. Yeah, they're all wearing, like, very work-appropriate outfits. And a man wearing a pinstripe suit with a colorful tie is talking to them. And this turns out to be Mr. Caldwell, the new VP. Now, he has... No IMDb credit. That's stupid. And even the Wikia doesn't have the actor's name, so I have no idea who he is. How is it? No clue. This is like that song from the last episode. Yeah. How does the internet not have the answer? Yeah, I have no idea. He's got lines. He must have a SAG card. Yeah. But he's not He's not credited on okay. IMDb at all. Well, if anyone recognizes him, point him our way. Yeah, no idea. It's very, very weird. Mm-hmm. Anyway. He's speaking. Kind of turned around. Mm-hmm. And Prue sort of sneaks in and sits down in the empty chair next to Jack. Yeah, and she's still wearing this corset outfit. So she immediately ruins the work appropriateness of this meeting. Yeah. So she and Jack have a little whispered conversation before Caldwell calls her out for trying to sneak in late and asks her name. And she stutters a bit, but she finally gets her name out. And then we see Piper sneaking a glance into the room. Piper is now wearing jeans and a white top under a white sweater. It's a much more work-appropriate outfit than what Prue is wearing, so it begs the question, if she had time to change her clothes, why didn't Prue? Don't know. Just saying. I I have zero answers for you. Yeah. Anyway, Caldwell pairs Prue up with Jack and tells everyone in the room that they have until the next night to raise $100,000 of auction material in order to keep their jobs. So it's a very The Apprentice sort of challenge. Sure. 
I guess. I don't know. I don't actually watch that show. I Yeah, I have no idea. I've never it. just seen it. sounds like something that would be on a celebrity game show about office work. Don't know. Never seen it. Don't care to. Back to the show. Caldwell leaves. And the rest of the people in the room start to leave. Mm -hmm. And then Jack starts talking to Prue, and he's like, we may have to work through dinner. Yeah, and we can see Piper standing outside impatiently. And, and then there's, a, there's like, a, a moment where Prue... <laughs> thank, thank you, Blue. Blue. There's a moment where Prue is, like, trying to get out of her chair, but also trying to talk to Jack. And then it looks like she goes unconscious. Her head drops while mm -hmm. her hand's on the armrests. And then suddenly... She appears next to Piper in this weird golden, like, glow fade thing. Yeah, it was a little weird. And they're both rightfully confused by this. And we see that the Prue inside the office is just sitting still with her eyes closed. And the secondary Prue, seeing herself sitting next to Jack, then disappears. And the original Prue comes back with a bit of heavy breathing. And Jack makes some crack about how she's not paying attention to him. Yeah, but she deflects by saying that she's feeling a little weird and she's still breathing a little funny and yeah but she gets up and walks over to piper who wants to know what, what the, the hell, hell just, just happened. happened yeah and we learn that this has been our first case of astral projection yay and piper asks how prue did it and prue says i just felt a desperate need for there to be two of me and, and then there was. Yep. All of a sudden there was. And so Piper thinks that this is her powers growing, which Prue basically agrees with. And then they leave before it happens again. And we cut to a beige car driving very fast and we hear sirens and stuff. So Daryl, it seems, has a crappy looking undercover car. Mm -hmm. I will give them this. It doesn't appear to be a Crown Victoria. Yeah, I don't think it's a Crown Vic. I think it's a Chevy. Yeah, I think it was. We see Phoebe and Daryl inside the car. They're on their way to M. Steadwell's place. Phoebe has added a white jacket to her outfit. The sirens are on. Daryl's driving really fast. And the entire scene is very jumpy. Like, the camera is on a trampoline. It was very hard to watch, so I apologize if I miss anything important, because I couldn't really watch it. Yeah, and also the, the flashing lights. Yeah, there were flashing lights as well, but that didn't bother me nearly as much as... The trampoline mm. camera. I think it was because the camera was in a car that was ahead of them, and they tried to have a steady cam thing, but the car is still moving, so that's not going to do much. Yeah, there was no stabilization happening, and it well, there made was me sick. there was enough stabilization happening to where you could see Phoebe and Daryl, yeah, but, but not enough so that they weren't moving. Yeah, because they didn't CGI this. Yeah, no, and it it just it hurt my head to watch it. Anyway, Phoebe is kind of egging Daryl on, saying, "Hey, you can ask me anything about you know being witches," but yeah. he's he's being a stick in the mud. And he's like, "I don't want to know." Yeah, but so she starts to tell him anyway, and he continues to shut her down. I don't want to know. Yeah. And he made some sort of joke about, like, I don't want to know if you have, you know, a, a broom or a cauldron or a, or a dust buster, which yeah. brought me back to Sabrina the Teenage Witch yeah. <laughs> flashbacks. It's kind of funny. But so somebody lays on the horn, possibly Daryl, really couldn't tell because, again, wasn't really watching very closely in this particular scene. But he speeds into a left turn, which seems to frighten Phoebe a bit. And he explains that he sees enough deaths in the normal world, so he's not sure that he wants to be dragged into another one. And she's like, it's probably too late. Yeah, a little bit. She assures him that they won't let anything happen to him. And then they seem to have gotten to M. Steadwell's place just before 10 a.m. So then we cut over to M. Steadwell's little shop. And we see a woman wearing a purple skirt and orange shirt with patterned trim at the collar and a patterned belt. It was a very eclectic outfit. She's walking up to the door holding a key. So now I shall tell you about her because why wouldn't I? The actress is Heidi Hinden Walsh. She was born on the 1st of February, 1971 in Davenport, Iowa. I know where that is. Mm -hmm. She is an American actress. She is also a singer, but she is most active in voiceover. She's got the voice for it. Yes. She started acting in 1992, and she is still acting. And some of the voices you might recognize her for are Princess Bubblegum in Adventure Time, Starfire in Teen Titans, Summer in Henry Huggle Monster, yeah. and Valina on Super Robot Monkey Team Hyperforce Go! I literally only included those last two so I could say those names. Yeah, and you woke up blue with them. I'm sorry, blue. But blue. Blue. come blue. on. Like, I'll put a link to the Robot Monkey one on the website just so you can go through and see some of the other actors who have voiced roles in it, because it's a hoot. 
There was a lot of them. Will Wheaton did an episode. Yep, yep. Corey Feldman was in, oh like, God. almost... Uh, I think he was in all of the episodes. Mark, Mark Hamill. Hamill. Yep. Ashley Johnson of Coke Roll fame and Blind Spot fame. Love, love me some Ashley Johnson. Eric Idle. Oh, man. Tara Strong. Well, Tara Strong's a fucking everything. Lacey yes, but, Chabert? But, but Tara Strong was only in two episodes. Lacey so Chabert. Go. Yeah, Lacey Chabert was in. Rip Taylor. Uh, yeah. Not Rip Torn? No, not Rip Torn. Rip Taylor. Michael York? Yeah. Like, a lot of people have been in oh, at least John one episode. Oh, John Davies! Yeah. So back to this show. <laughs> Our eclectically dressed woman puts the key into the lock and we're shown there's a bomb attached to the door on the inside and, and it is quietly beeping. beeping. Yeah. She unlocks the bottom lock and then puts her key in the top lock and we cut back to the car as Phoebe notices her and they pull up outside the shop, which is just called New Age Books. And Daryl gets out just as she starts to turn the door handle. He yells at her, runs over to her, and pushes her away from the door just before the door swings open and the place blows up. Phoebe runs over, asking if everyone's okay. Daryl's like, I am. And it turns to Miss Dreadwell to ask. And she's like, sitting on the ground, legs straight out, giggling. Yeah. And she's like, oh my god, it actually worked! My protection spell! Yeah. She's laughing. It was, it she was is the very so first, delighted. Yeah, it was the very first protection spell that she's ever cast and it actually worked. And then Daryl's all like, don't tell me she's a witch too. And Phoebe just kind of shrugs. It was adorable. It, it takes all kinds. Yeah, it was, it was great. So then we cut, we get to see the Oakland Bay Bridge in the background as we pan over to a white building that has some sort of something weird painted on the side. Uh, yeah. It looks like a man holding a globe while standing over a bridge. It was very weird. When I get the pictures up on the website, you'll see it. Sorry. Inside, we have Prue and Piper. They walk out of an elevator into a very lavish apartment. Prue is very impressed and starts listing off all of the expensive items in the room, as she is wont to do. Mm -hmm. Piper says that she'll check the kitchen while Prue takes the bedroom. We see her open a closet to find faux fur coats and leather clothes, and she gets very excited about them. Very yeah. excited. Yeah, it's a little creepy how excited she gets about them. It's more amusing than creepy. Well, then we cut over to Piper in the kitchen. There's a lot of clothing envy involved. Yes, there's a lot of clothing envy involved. Mm -hmm. We cut over to Piper. She is in the kitchen. She looks in the fridge and the cupboards. They're both empty. Then we cut back to Prue, who opens a cabinet and sees wigs and jewelry. There are three wigs. Two of the wigs are on white, like, long-necked styrofoam mannequin heads. And the third one is on, like, a beige, more realistic, plastic-looking mannequin head. It's a little weird, slightly creepy, and I'm just glad that nobody painted eyes on them. Because that would have been... I used to have one of those heads. I did paint eyes on it. I still have one of those heads. It is in my closet. It is holding my cowboy hat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't worn that cowboy hat in, like over a decade mm. and yet it still comes with me to every apartment i go to mm. and we cut back to piper who mm. is picking up the mail and all of it says current resident written on it yep and then we go back to prue who has changed her clothes she is now wearing a low-cut leather dress and a coat with a black fur collar she changes very fast yes she's got supersonic clothing envy yeah and she changed awfully fast into leather just saying and we don't see her clothes anywhere so i don't know where her clothes went at least i don't remember mm -hmm. seeing her clothes anywhere doesn't matter anyway she looks in the mirror she starts twirling she's as... very like oh oh yeah this is her o face <laughs> indeed she starts twirling as piper enters mentioning the mail and then asks about the twirling like what did i just like see that were, were, were you twirling and she's like no, but opportunity knocked and I had to answer. It was like, really? Uh -huh. Okay. She starts sure. gushing over all of the stuff she's found in the bedroom. The clothes, the wigs. There's a bunch of crap to conceal your identity. Yep. And Piper's like, wow, I don't think anyone knew what she even looked like. Yeah. Which, hang on, she had passports. Was this before passports required a photo? I don't think so. I don't think so, but we didn't see the photos in the passports. This is true. So they could have been slightly different... Mm hmm Whatever. This is Doesn't true. matter. Piper mentions that there are roses in the living room that are addressed to Ms. Hellfire. Oh, yeah. So we get the episode title. 
Prue seems intrigued by this, and she walks out to the living room to read the card on the roses, which says, Until we meet at last, Bane. So she naturally leans in to smell the roses. Yep. And this is when the elevator doors open. Yep, and we get three guys entering the apartment holding guns. The two in the background don't even get IMDb credits. The one who's in the front is a ginger and is wearing a shiny yellow shirt under a black jacket. And he's like the kind of hair that's like starting to recede, but Mm -hmm. it's also in a ponytail. Yeah. And he's got a goatee. Yeah. He calls He calls her Ms. Hellfire. She asks if he's Bane. And no, this is his right-hand man, DJ. DJ. Yeah. So since he has a name, I'll tell you about him right quick because there's not a whole lot to tell. The actor is Courtney Gaines. He was born August 22nd, 1965 in Los Angeles, California. He is an American actor best known for his portrayal of Malachi in the 1984 horror classic, Children of the Corn, based on the novel by Stephen King. Mm -hmm. He's been in a bunch of stuff. He's still acting. He actually has seven projects in post-production, one in pre-production, one completed, and one filming as of the time of recording this. He's a very busy guy. So busy. So busy. Anyway, back to the show. The background guy on the left is wearing a shiny purple shirt under a long black jacket with the sleeves scrunched up. And the one on the right is just wearing a black t-shirt. They both put their guns down, walk over to Prue, and DJ tells her that Bane is very unhappy with her and wants to see her. And Piper's hand just kind of flashes out from in the other room and freezes them. Yep. She tries to get Prue to leave with her. She's like, you know, sorry, dudes. And Prue, realizing that they think that she's Hellfire, sees this as an opportunity to figure out who wants them dead. She says that because nobody knows what she looks like, she can pretend to be her. Piper is not very easy about this. And Prue's like, no, I can protect myself. It's only a matter of time before whoever wants them dead realizes they're not dead. And she asks if Piper has a better idea. Which she does not. So she goes into the other room and she unfreezes them by just sticking her hand around the wall. It's kind of funny. And then Prue and the guys leave and Piper watches with worry as they get on the elevator. And we go to commercial break. Mm, and all the convenience, the dudes on the elevator did not see her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a thing. We come back from the commercial in what must be Bane's place of employment. Yeah. We or see. Whatever. It doesn't look like an apartment, it looks more like a lounging area in, like, a bar, which is apparently what it actually is. A classy bar. Yeah, well. A classy hotel bar. I don't know about all that, but. Okay. We see a man sitting on a couch, and since he is instantly recognizable, I shall tell you about him. This actor is Antonio Sabato Jr. Yeah. Yes, he was born February 29th, 1972, in Rome, Italy. He is an Italian-born American actor and model. He was born in Italy, but raised in the United States. He first became known as a Calvin Klein model, and for his role on the soap opera General Hospital, which I know we have mentioned before. He has continued appearing in films and television series throughout the 90s and the 2000s. Here's a funny thing, right? So his mother, thank you, Blue, Yvonne Kobuchi, Kobuchi, is, yeah, she is a realtor. She was born in Prague in the former Czechoslovakia. And his father, Antonio Sovato Sr., is an Italian actor. His maternal grandfather was a Czech aristocrat. And his maternal grandmother was Jewish and survived the Holocaust. So go grandma. Mm -hmm. His family moved to the United States when he was 13 in 1985. And in 1996, he became a naturalized citizen of the United States. Hmm. He competed in a 2008 NBC competition that I have never heard of called Celebrity Circus, which he happened to actually win. He noted during the show that both his mother and his mother's father had been circus performers. So the realtor and the Czech aristocrat were circus (laughs) performers. What? Interesting. Wow. That's hilarious. Yeah. He has appeared and competed in a number of reality television shows, including My Antonio in 2009, in which various women competed to become his girlfriend. Yeah. The show notably featured his ex-wife, Tully Jensen, as one of the contestants. She was trying to win him back, but she came in third place. What the shit? And his mother also appeared on the show providing advice. The show's winner was Brooke Barlow. They dated for a bit, but nothing actually came of it. Oh my god, that's that's a bachelor worthy of a soap opera star. 
Yes. However, Oy. he is also a registered Republican, nah. endorsed Trump during his campaign, nah. and spoke at the opening night of the Republican convention in support of Trump. And he thinks that President Obama is a Muslim. So I'm going to stop talking about him now. Anyway, so this character is Bane. We are assuming that because that's who we were just speaking about. But originally, the role of Bane was supposed to be played by the actor Richard Grieco. Can I see a picture? Huh. Mm-hmm. Creepy little mofo. Mm-hmm. He's Italian and he Irish. Looks, his facial structure looks like a velociraptor. <laughs> I have never had a more accurate description of that, and that was the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. So, Bane was supposed to be Richard Grieco, but... Uh-huh. Thank you, Blue. But Shannon objected to his casting and was quickly supported in that decision by Alyssa and Holly. So I wonder what he did that they didn't want him. Well, he probably chased them through a kitchen. A la Jurassic and Park because he looks like a velociraptor. open doors. Oh, man. <laughs> and um, got locked in a cold storage unit. <laughs> Oh, God, now I have to leave in the Velociraptor line just so that makes sense. Anyway, (laughs) since he's not on the show, I'm not going to tangent on him, but I'll put links to his IMDb and his wiki on the website for anyone who cares. Anyway, back to the show. So, Bane is wearing a grayish purple shirt and black pants, and there's a nervous man wearing a shiny blue jacket and black pants standing in front of him. And off to the side, there's a blonde guy in a gray outfit and black leather jacket. He looks like he's supposed to be a bodyguard, but he's not really doing much but standing there. And we don't see him again for the rest of the episode, so I don't know. Bane must have an extensive retinue. Sure. Anyway, so this dude in the shiny blue shirt is Mm -hmm. super nervous because apparently he lied to Bane and is trying very hard to say he didn't know he was lying. Yeah. And then Bane sees Prue walk by... And her decolletage makes him tell the guy never to lie to him again and sends him on his way, as opposed to probably, I don't know, killing him? Yeah, though we aren't sure that he doesn't kill him later. This is true. But, but you know, um, we never see him he again. Sees, he sees the woman he believes to be Miss Hellfire, and he's, well, uh, uh, probably the tightness of his pants affects his judgment, <laughs> judgment ability. Yeah, so the guy thanks him, walks away toward Prue, then Bane gets up, heads in that direction as well. And as the shiny jacket guy walks past Prue, we see three men in shiny red shirts cleaning the bar. Apparently shiny outfits is a thing for this group. I I just love that apparently wardrobe's idea for in mafia type business means shiny shiny shirts. Yep. Shiny shirts, shiny jackets. I can't say that. That's necessarily a bad call, though, because these are pretty shiny shirts. They really are. Like, they're not just pretty shiny. They're pretty and shiny. Yes. I kind of actually really liked the shiny purple shirt of mm-hmm. the, the secondary bad guy who didn't yeah. have any lines or anything. I remember I had a shiny white shirt for orchestra in middle school. It had kind of like bell okay. sleeves. Okay. It was nice. Hmm. Anyway, Bane walks up to Prue, calls her beautiful, and asks how she liked the roses. And she's like, I would have preferred orchids. And he seems happy that she's honest as well as beautiful. <laughs> He then tells DJ, you know what to bring. Condoms. (laughs) No, that's not what he meant. It's what he wants him to bring. Um, No. DJ nods as Prue and Bane walk away. They head up the stairs and he asks what to call her. And of course, since Prue has no fucking clue what her actual name is supposed to be, she's just like, you can continue calling me what you've been calling me. Yeah, which is Ms. Hellfire. But he seems taken aback because her email seemed less cold. Because apparently Ms. Hellfire seems cold in person. Yeah. She takes off her jacket, they sit down, and he wonders why she didn't confirm the death of the Halliwells, and she says that she didn't have a clean shot. He asks then about Steadwell. And she pauses for a moment before saying, it was a blast. And he kind of chuckles. Yeah, he he seems very pleased by this. He then reminds her that she only has until midnight to kill the Halliwells, and then DJ comes up and opens a bottle of champagne for them. And she's like, don't worry, I know their every move. Yeah. And he says that he's getting pressured by the one who hired them. It was a, like, I'm getting pressure. By who? You know who. And I immediately... Voldemort? Yeah, I immediately had Harry Potter vibes and went, nope, nope, not, nope, that, that, no. Nope. Though that did exist. Yes, it did. But no... It was not a thing. Mm. Anyway, 
DJ then pours champagne into two glasses and Prue's phone rings, but Bane apparently thinks it was his phone. Like he goes to reach for something and he stops himself and she hasn't answered the phone. So DJ is like, are you going to answer that? So she does. And then we cut over and see Jack sitting at her desk at Buckland's. He is wearing a light gray shirt and tie to match, though the tie is very loosely tied. Well, he's quite stressed. He's gonna get together a hundred grand worth of shit. Mm-hmm. And sitting in front of him is a Vio laptop. Yeah, I'm not gonna change it on it because it's not really important, but I'll, I'll link to them on the website. Though, because I am me, I do want to give a little bit, mostly because we talked about anagrams earlier. Originally... VIO was an anagram of Video Audio Integrated Operation, but it was then amended to Visual Audio Intelligent Organizer in 2008 to celebrate the brand's 10th anniversary. That's how they celebrate? Apparently. It started out They as... must be real shit at birthday presents. <laughs> well, it started out as a Sony brand, and it was sold in 2014 to Japan Industrial Partners. And in 2016, they announced the unveiling of a Windows 10 smartphone. They didn't unveil one. They announced the unveiling of one. Weird, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway... So, quick as we can through this conversation. Jack asks where she went. Prue says, I'm with a client. He says, it better be a rich client. Bane hands Prue a glass of champagne. And then Jack is, well, he says champagne. Yeah. Hands it to her. And then Jack's like, where the fuck are you? Bane clinks glasses. Jack is like, Prue, we're really under pressure here. Yep. She gasps. And suddenly, she's astral projecting into the office. Yeah, she astral projects just outside the open door of her office. And since she's gone quiet on the phone, Jack calls out to her. And then we find that the astral form can actually speak because she goes, oh my God, and then disappears just before Jack looks up. He literally misses her by like a fraction of a second. Yep. She comes back to her body, slightly gasping and shaking, Bane wondering what happened. She tells Jack she'll call him back, and then she hangs up on him and apologizes to Bane, who takes the champagne away from her, which I thought was kind mm -hmm. of funny. And then when she tries to leave, he's like, you're not leaving, unless I'm driving you. Yep. So they both grab their jackets, Prue starts walking down the stairs, and then Bane stops to talk to DJ, telling him to go to his office and he'll show, but we aren't meant to know who he is at this time. Mm -hmm. Bane walks away, and then we cut over to his office, with its orange walls. Ugh. DJ walks in, sits on the edge of the desk, and then Barb disappears in, in a, a puff, puff of smoke, smoke, sitting in the desk chair behind DJ. He's wearing all black, though there are, th like, three silver buttons noticed. Mm -hmm. Like, big, gaudy silver yeah. buttons on the jacket. He surprises DJ because he talks. And mm -hmm. DJ was like, you weren't there before. How the fuck did you get in here? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. He asks about the witches not being dead and basically says that he knows that they aren't dead because he can smell them. Like, he does that little sniff the air thing and it was just creepy. But, you know, yeah. par for the course with the fear demon, right? Mm -hmm. And apparently Barbus has made some sort of deal that gives him a 24-hour window to break free, but he needs 13 witches dead for it to work. He doesn't say 13. He just says that, that he needs them to kill those witches. I know, but it is so, Barbus, so we know that there's 13 involved. Right, but we haven't been told that yet. It's Barbus, though. I know. Anyway. Infer. Yes, infer. DJ, that's like him. Yeah, infer. Anyway. DJ wants to know who he is, so Barbus says that he is a demon who can turn the innermost fears of a mortal into reality. And then he does his thing where he passes his hand in front of DJ's face, and he's like, your greatest fear is that your boss is being double-crossed, and you'll be killed for not protecting him. Yeah, which, can I just say, that's kind of a crap fear to have as your greatest fear. My greatest fear is my boss is being double-crossed? Really? And that his boss will blame him for not... No, I get Lying that, but, like, really? That's your greatest fear? Being killed by your boss? I can understand that. That I get. I get. I I don't know. Well, I at guess, any rate, but... the door gets flung open, Bane appears with a, to like, not a time gun, but, like, a machine gun, yeah. and starts shooting DJ, who, who yells starts yelling, and, like, he falls flails, to the floor. falls to the floor, yeah. Then Bane disappears in a puff of smoke, the doors close, and Barbus <laughs> leans down over DJ, and he's like... Pretty, Pretty cool, cool huh? huh? Yeah. Which, okay, I think Barbus was doing, like, a fear light demonstration. Yeah, he wasn't trying otherwise, to kill him. Yeah. Because normally what Barbus does is he gives you your greatest fear, he does that, and then it kills you via fear. But he doesn't really care about this guy. He isn't a witch, so he doesn't want him dead. This is true. Doesn't really care. So then we get an exterior shot of the manor. 
because, you know, can't stay in one place too long. So we have popped over to the manor. We get Dan looking at the broken windows in the wicker room. He is wearing a gray t-shirt and jeans with a tool belt. Piper is holding the phone and pacing back and forth. Hold the phone. Okay, go. Okay. <laughs> I might actually leave that in just because it was funny. You're um, welcome. <laughs> anyway. He says he'll have his crew install temporary windows, and we find that Piper is worried about Prue. Because, of course she is. She's mm -hmm. Piper. After a bit more innocuous conversation, Dan tells Piper that he wants her to move in with him. And he says it in a very, like, blurted out sort of way. Yeah. And, when and she then she's seems... a little shocked, and he's like, you know, until the windows are installed, yeah, your sisters, permanent, can, also, your sisters can also move in. Yeah. There's plenty of room since Jenny moved back with her parents. So here we go. <laughs> Jenny, who hasn't been seen since episode 206, has now completely been written out. Yep. We never hear about her again, I do believe. And, and it's I'm... not even specified whether or not she moved to, to Saudi, Saudi Arabia, Arabia or, or not. not. Yeah, she just moved back with her parents, and that's yeah. all we know, and that's all we need to know. Yeah. Yes. And in response to Dan's offer, Piper tries to deflect it with a little humor, but he's, of course, super serious. Yep. And he says that if everything works out, that she could stay permanently. Like, move it a bit fast, Yeah, don't you nine think, episodes, dude? sweetie. That's, that's too fast. Yeah, like, I know it's been a couple of months, but it's still just been a couple of months. Like, mm -hmm. seriously, dude. I mean, to be fair, they do live next door. No, I get that, but still. Anyway, Phoebe then comes home and calls out for Piper, who relates her location. And she's still reeling from Dan's question. He asks her to think about mm -hmm. it. And then in walk... Phoebe and Miss Steadwell. Yeah, who starts to say something, but Piper freezes both her and Dan before she can finish the word. She, was she basically, kind of like points at Dan and is like, is he? Yeah, she was basically asking if he's a witch too. Uh huh. Which I thought was kind of funny that she's like, I, I don't think, mm -hmm. no, don't sh just shush. Yes, very strategic freeze. Yep. Which they then use to catch it catch each other up on the events thus far, including Prue's new power. Which Much Phoebe... to the chagrin oh. of Phoebe. Yeah. yeah. She's like, are you kidding me? Nope. Are you kidding me? Nope. Like, it was, it was uh -huh. very cute. Piper says that she'll send Dan home, and they agree to keep their new guest in the house. And then Phoebe walks away, and we end the scene with no one being unfrozen. Now, here's the thing. I didn't go over the, the dialogue of the scene, but... Phoebe tells Piper that the woman she brought home is M. Studwell. And then Piper calls her Marcy. When did Piper learn her name? Because it was not In said. In a cutscene? But when? I don't know. Like, no, I'm saying they probably deleted the scene where she told her. Like, that's the only thing I can think of is yeah. somehow, like, Phoebe called the house and was like, we got Marcy Steadwell. Like, there was no other mention. Like, this is the first time we hear the name Marcy. Because even Daryl called her Miss Steadwell. Anyway, so... Back at Miss Hellfire's apartment, Prue and Bane exit the elevator. Prue thanks him for the ride, but then gets sidetracked by the room being filled with orchids. He reminds her that she said she preferred them, to which she is impressed. Which means, and I don't know how he did this, how he indicated to someone, because he was with her the entire time. Did he, like, he couldn't have texted someone, could he? Maybe, but I'm assuming that, because we didn't see the entire thing. This is true. Maybe he just, like, whispered in someone's ear, like, Hey, bud. Orchids. Well, because I know that, like... A shit ton of orchids. Yes. All of the orchids. Yes. Every single fucking one. Yes. Buy out the orchids. Got it. Orchids the size of an orca. <laughs> an, orca an orca's worth of orchids. Anyway. He then tells her to trust him and close her eyes. She does, and he gets a jewelry case out of his pocket and tells her to open her eyes. She does, and he hands her the box and tells her not to open it until he leaves. And then he reminds her that she has to kill the Halliwells by midnight and then changes his mind and says, have it done by 10 so that he can do it if she fails to. Mm. And then he kisses her and heads to the elevator and she opens the case just as he walks out of view. Like, he hasn't even completely entered the elevator yet. Mm -hmm. And we are shown a necklace of white and pink diamonds. Which I swear was something I wore to my freshman homecoming. Okay. Just the style. Okay. She lets out a little breath because she knows how expensive that necklace is. And she walks off camera and we dissolve 
into a brand new exterior shot of the coroner's office before heading inside. It says, you know, chief medical examiner, coroner on the side, and then it pans over to the doors. Aren't those two different things? Yes. Okay. Yes, there's the chief medical examiner and the coroner. So it's chief medical examiner on the top, coroner underneath, Uh, and it pans over to the side. Okay. And we have a new coroner played by Tom Simmons. He has no picture on IMDb, but he started acting in 1985 and he's still going. He's mostly done single episodes of TV shows or TV movies. Not a whole lot. Did he have a coronation? I don't think so. Anyway, the name Tom Simmons, not exactly the easiest thing to find on wiki so i'll only put the imdb up there whatever anyway dj and barbus walk in startling our new coroner and then dj pushes him onto a table barbus learns that his greatest fear is being autopsied himself and then a cutting implement turns on and flies up in the air ready to attack the coroner who yells and then we have a small time jump and see DJ and Barbus opening up a morgue slab. They pull out a body, unzip the body bag, and find that the victim inside doesn't look much like an explosion victim. Nope, so, because it's Ms. Hellfire. Yeah, so Barbus says that DJ's fear of a double cross are justified, and we go to commercial break. So once again, we lose a coroner. Oh, man. So, so many coroners just just yep. gone. Just one hit onesers. Indeed. So we come back from the commercial break with an exterior night shot of the manor. And in the kitchen, Marcy is puttering around. She opens up a cupboard and yells out, Oh, oh my stars! stars! It was just the cutest thing. Like, with thing. that inflection. Yeah, it was just the cutest thing. Piper and Phoebe zoom in, and they're like, What's wrong? But then Marcy just turns around with a couple of packages of herbs in her hands, and she's like, You cannot put Wolfsbane and Holy Thistle on the same shelf. Their harmonies are in complete opposition. Yeah, they're harmonics. Harmonics. Oh, yeah. God. Their harmonics are in complete opposition. And she's like, I don't know how any of your spells actually work. Yeah. And then Piper gets pissy because it's her fucking I, kitchen. I believe, I believe she says, I don't know how you can cast a spell worth a darn. Yeah. Which was just adorable. Mm-hmm. So Piper gets a little bit upset with the, look here, missy. But before she can really react, they hear a car door slam outside. And Phoebe looks out the window to see Prue's leather-clad form walking up the driveway next to a black Porsche. And they walk out of the kitchen as Prue comes in the front door. Piper makes mention of the outfit, to which Prue says she didn't want to risk anyone seeing her out of uniform. Which is why she drove up to the Halliwell house and used her key in the front door. Yeah, she parked in the driveway and walked into the house using a key. Okay, Sure, Prue. I'm sure that's the reason you're still wearing the leather dress. Mm Mm-hmm. Anyway, Piper says that she's been worried. Phoebe asked about the car, and Prue just wants to know what they know as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. They tell her that Marcy is safe, but the kitchen might not be. Yeah. And then they go through and they realize that the 11 names on the list are actually 13 once you count the fact that P. Halliwell stands for three people. Exactly. So that clicks with them that the demon that they're battling is Barbus. So even though they vanquished him before, he must have figured out some sort of loophole to come back. Now, from the IMDb goofs section, somebody had said that the sisters refer to Barbus in his real name. However, in his previous and first appearance, his real name was never revealed. He is only known as the Demon of Fear, even in the Book of Shadows. However, in the episode From Fear to Eternity, as seen by the pictures I took for episode 113, they show the page in the Book of Shadows that explains who the Demon of Fear is, and in the very first sentence it says, also known as Barbus, so the girls absolutely would have known he was called Barbus. That reminds me, they didn't do this on the 13th episode of the season. Didn't do what? Oh, I mean, this is episode 209. Last year they did the Friday the 13th thing on the 13th episode. This year they didn't. I'm thinking they probably moved it around or were okay with it not being the 13th episode because it was going to be on the 13th of the month. Could be. So they probably looked at the show schedule and were like, sure, why not? Yeah. This is as close to a Friday the 13th as we're going to get. Could be. I do not know. So we get a moment where they're still worried about Prue pretending to be Hellfire and flirting with the dark side. I mean, all she's flirting with. 
Yeah. Phoebe reminds Prue that Barbus can use her fear against her. Prue and says that she's already conquered her fear of drowning. Last and, episode, too. Yep. And thinks that he can't get to her anymore. But Phoebe says what I was thinking, which is he can always find another fear that she has. Mm -hmm. Why Prue didn't think of that is a la convenience, yep. I'm sure. Prue assures Phoebe that she knows she can't face Barbus alone, tells them she'll check in with them later, and leaves as Phoebe and Piper look skeptically at each other. Yeah. And then we cut over to an exterior shot of a bar called the Reptile Room, really? which is apparently the name of Bane's place. Inside, we see people dancing, mostly to the beat of the music being played, and then Prue walks in. And on the DVD, the song that's being played is Find My Baby by Moby. Nah. So I'll link to Moby oh, on the Moby. website. I'm not going to tangent on him. I checked Netflix just because I knew that this was a an actual like song whatever netflix had just some sort of nondescript music playing but uh -huh. that's why i say they were mostly dancing to the beat of the music because they were more dancing to the moby song than the mm -hmm. other one but it wasn't too horribly off so it wasn't jarring to see it didn't take you out of the moment yeah prue has changed into some leather pants whoa 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 and a leather bikini style top with a floor length coat that's got like Leather sleeves, but fur on the wrists and, like, a bunch of fur around the collar and shit. Yeah, she also has a necklace that's, like, a green string wrapped multiple times mm -hmm. around her neck. And it has, like, peacock feathers on the ends that are, like, one is up by one shoulder and the other is, like, down by one boob. Mm -hmm. It was, it's a little hard to describe. Again, when the pictures are finally on the website, you'll get to see it. Again, sorry, it's taking And there's so a, long. A, a great slow-mo shot of her, like, walking in. Yeah. And Bane sees her and walks up to her, and he's wearing a shiny silver shirt under a black suit jacket. And she takes off her coat, and we can now see that her hair, which is normally, like, shoulder length, has been pulled back into a ponytail, and she has got some extensions going on. Because, it's like an extension ponytail Yeah, thing. because now her hair is almost to her butt. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we can kind of see that the pants lace up the sides a bit, but it yeah. was a little hard to see at this moment. We'll see it better later, and I'll make mention, mm -hmm. let me tell you. Bane asks if the Halliwells are dead, to which Prue responds, the night is young. Yeah, because it's only, like, after eight mm -hmm. at this point. Yes, and she's like, I want my money, because Barbus has a nasty habit of disappearing in the middle of the night. Yeah. She asks if she can trust them both and asks to speak to Barbus, but Bane decides that they should go dancing first because, you know. Because, again, those tight pants are making it very hard for him to use his proper judgment. Yep. So they walk over to the crowded dance floor and start dancing really close together and then smiling at each other and then they start kissing. And then DJ walks up and taps Bane on the shoulder and he's like, we need to talk. Yeah, so they stop kissing, much to the annoyance of Bane. He's like, yeah, this better be life or death. And he excuses himself, kisses the top of Prue's hand, and walks over to the bar with DJ. Prue's like, I'll amuse myself, staying in character, and starts dancing with the random guy who was standing behind her. Yeah. You know. Then we cut over to Bane and DJ at the bar. And DJ informs Bane that Marcy isn't dead, but the real Miss Hellfire probably is. Bane watches Prue, who's watching him right back, even though she's still dancing with the random guy. Bane says he doesn't believe it, but DJ says that Barbus believes it. And then we get a quick shot of Prue going back to dancing with the random guy. And then we cut to the manor, because we can't stay in one place too long. Marcy is kind of skipping around the house, waving a smudge stick, and singing out some protection it wasn't it wasn't really singing either she was kind of chanting yeah it was kind of a chanting it was thing like no 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 kind of kind of like yeah, catholic was, whatever yeah a little um, bit was... singing out a protection spell and piper's on the phone trying to get a hold of prue yeah and she puts up with the singing for like a moment trying to block it out with like a finger in the ear but finally she's just like okay that's enough of that and she freezes her and then she's like i wonder how long i can keep her frozen and the doorbell rings but i i love like Phoebe is basically like, it's your power, so it's your call. <laughs> like, you yeah. can keep her frozen forever. I don't care. But the doorbell rings, and then Phoebe thinks somehow that there's a possibility that it's Prue. She's just lost her keys, which is met with a lovely Piper eye roll. And then we jump over to Piper answering the door. 
She opens it to Dan, who has added a blue plaid overshirt to his outfit. And a large piece of plywood. Yeah. He walks inside holding the plywood, saying that it is for his crew, because apparently they have been having a hard time finding plywood. Phoebe and Piper have this moment where they try and communicate via mumble. Yeah, it's really, really funny. Phoebe kind of, like, jumps into view and is like, don't forget about the mini mini bur Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was adorable. And so then Piper decides to help Dan carry the plywood in. And the way she does it is she just, like, lifts it up further so he can't see into the living room where Marcy is. Yeah. So oh. they walk past holding the board in frame there. Phoebe goes back to the frozen Marcy, who is now covered, covered in a blanket. Like a fucking statue. It's great. Yeah, it was adorable. It was, like, this little, like, Afghan, like, mm-hmm. quilt thing. She takes the blanket off and it was very funny because you could you could tell she was in a different position. Well, she was in a slightly different position and she was no longer like digitally frozen, so yeah. she was trying to stay still, but when the blanket comes off her arm moved. It was yeah. kind of funny. So, Phoebe takes the blanket off. She waits for Marcy to unfreeze, which only takes about a second. And when she does, she continues her song for a moment and then notices that Piper is gone. Phoebe tells her that Piper cast a little spell of her own, which seemed to make Marcy excited about that. And then she says that there's lots of other rooms in the house that need protecting, ushers her upstairs, trying to keep her quiet. Yeah. We cut over to the wicker room, and Piper and Dan are putting down the plywood. They talk about basically nothing for a Mm -hmm. bit. And then he's like, have you thought about, you know, moving in? She hesitates, and he's like, I don't want to push you. You can let me know when you're ready. Yep. And then they have a nice little kiss. Yeah, and we have a bit of a continuity error moment here. When the camera is on Dan, he has his left hand around Piper's head. And when the camera is on Piper, he has his right hand on her head. Mm-hmm. It's just a little continuity thing. Yeah. He walks away and Piper looks conflicted as we hear the door open and close, signaling that he's left the house. And then we cut back over to Prue and Bane because can't stay in one place too long. Mm -hmm. And they're in Bane's office Mm -hmm. where he confronts her about killing Hellfire and she's like, you know, trying to keep playing the part. Yeah. And he also says that, you know, you killed the woman I love. Like, like, dude, you emailed. Yeah. Like. And she's a hit woman who you were hiring. Yeah. Like, I don't see how you would ever think that would work out. Well, it might have. You never know. Love finds a way. Well, I don't know. I think that kind of goes against HR policy about getting involved (laughs) with your subordinates. Hey, you know, they don't work at the same place, so that doesn't count. Yeah. Anyway, he pushes her away and into Barbus, who has now appeared in a puff of smoke. Barbus says that it's nice to see her again, Ms. Halliwell, and then passes his hand in front of her face. Bane is confused that she is a name on the list, and Barbus says that her greatest fear is that someone will kill her sisters. Because, of course it is, because you've now conquered the fear you had, so now you have a new one which makes sense. And now hers is the same as Phoebe's. Yes, indeed. He then places a hand on her forehead, And his voice gets deeper as he tells her that demons have assumed her sister's identities, so she must kill them by midnight. And she seems under his spell a bit, and she repeats that order of kill the imposters. Barbus seems very happy with this outcome, and Bane wants to deal with her after she kills her sisters. And we end on a shot of Prue before we go to commercial break. I believe this is our last commercial break. I believe so too. Yeah. The doorbell rings at the manor, and Phoebe answers it to Daryl. He's still in the same suit as before. Yay. Phoebe's like, hey, can you babysit Marcy while Piper and I go find Prue, who's impersonating a hit woman and hasn't checked in? Yeah. And he's like, no, Um, I want to go with you. Yeah, but he also tells them that they don't have to hide things from him anymore. And she's like, we don't want anything to happen to you. And he's He's like, I'm not Andy. Yeah, which is a lovely guilt trip. And then Piper and Marcy come down the stairs. Now, I do think it's interesting that earlier in the car, he didn't want to know anything about being a witch. And now he's saying that they don't have to hide anything. So he's changed his tune in the matter of a few hours. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it went from minor embarrassment to major disappointment. It changed keys. It did. It did indeed. It moved from the submediant to tonic. Yes. Which is a joke probably two people get. Yeah. You are one of them. I know. <laughs> anyway. And if any of you have taken music theory, you are the other. 
I've taken music theory and I don't get the joke, but that's okay. That's that, cool. That's okay. Anyway, so Piper and Marcy come into the room and Marcy squirts something from what looks like a perfume bottle into mm. the air. And she says that she's clearing the aura of the house. Daryl tells Marcy that she has to go with him because it'd be safer. But she still thinks that her protection spell is keeping her and everyone in the house safe. So she's like, well, if it's, if it's keeping them safe, imagine what it'll do for you. And then she kind of squirts him. Yeah, it was kind of funny. She heads toward the door to, to leave with him, and then she turns, squirts the potion in the air one more time. And says, my work here is done. Yep. And then Dale takes the bottle from her and is like, let's just leave this here, and hands it to Phoebe, who takes it with two fingers, which was very funny. And then he and Marcy leave. Back at Miss Hellfire's apartment, Piper and Phoebe exit the elevator. And they know Gru's there because they saw the Porsche out front, and they're hoping she's alone. Yep. She walks into the room, and this is where we can see that the leather pants that I thought were just laced a little bit, are laced completely up both sides. So it looks like she's not wearing underwear underneath those pants. That's got to be uncomfortable. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Piper says that they've been worried, and then Prue uses her power to fling Piper away, much to Phoebe's surprise. Prue then uses her power on Phoebe, and she falls to the ground and crawls over to Piper, asking if she's okay. She is not. Yeah. They stand up, walk quickly down the hall, and Phoebe says that Piper should freeze Prue. Piper's like, good witches don't freeze. And Phoebe's like, I don't think she's a good witch right now. Yeah, she doesn't look very good right now, so it might work. Prue then walks into the hallway saying, I won't let you kill my sisters, and then uses her power to fling a large decorative plate they toward Piper and Phoebe. They scream and duck, it smashes against the wall, and then they run out onto the patio. Yeah, it was, when it went flying, it was a, like a very CGI, like it got smaller on yeah. the fly. It was, it was odd. Mm -hmm. But, so they run out to the patio, Prue follows them, and they hide behind a piece of lattice work that has white flowers on it. Which Phoebe's apparently mildly allergic to, because she starts to do the sneeze. Yeah. Prue then sees them, because of the sneezing, and Piper smacks Phoebe on the arm, which was so sister-like. It yeah. was very funny. Prue starts heading toward them, and... Phoebe realizes that Prue doesn't know that they're her sisters. So Piper comes to the conclusion that they need to get Prue to astral project by making her want to be in two places at once. So they run in two different directions. Prue just kind of stands there because she's not sure which way to go. And so they both try to get her to follow them. After a little, you know, come get me, no me, no me. Yeah. Prue does that little gasping thing and then astral projects next to Piper. Piper calls to Phoebe, who starts heading toward her. And we are treated with a quick shot of a neon clock on the wall for some reason so that we can see the time. Didn't actually see what the time said because mm -hmm. whatever. And we see that Piper well, is- Well, because also you don't read clocks. I don't. So I didn't bother. <laughs> and there was no one in the room with me as I was watching the episode so they couldn't tell me what it said. <laughs> so there's that. Anyway, so Piper is backing away from Prue and Phoebe comes running up the stairs. As Phoebe is trying to get Prue to realize that Barbus has brainwashed her- we learn a few things that we didn't know before. For one, Prue apparently gave Piper the chicken pox. And we learn that Phoebe is the one that taught Prue how to French kiss. Because of course she did. Because, you know. Prue broke her ankle when she was seven. Yep. And that Prue and Piper went to Duran Duran together. I will put a link to Duran Duran on the website. I'm not going to tangent about them. I know someone whose last name is Duran. Well, all right. That's very interesting. Hmm. Prue apparently stretched out Piper's leg warmers and then gave them to Phoebe. So Prue asks how they know all this stuff, and Phoebe says that they're her sisters, and that's how they know. And then she starts to walk over toward Prue, and noticing Piper's lack of movement, grabs Piper's wrist to bring her over. She's like, get over here, and pulls yeah. her. It was kind of reminiscent of earlier in the day with the get over here on be yeah. behind the couch. It was kind of funny. Mm-hmm. Prue goes to hug Phoebe, but then Astro projects back into her body. And Phoebe and Piper go running over to the top of the stairs and look down at Prue, who has snapped out of the spell and wants to get Barbus. Piper says that they just have to lay low until midnight, and he'll go back to wherever he came from, but Prue thinks that that rule might not apply because he's already found one loophole to come back. So then she says, let's go show him what his greatest fear is. Phoebe and Piper give each other a glance and they head down to Prue. And this may be the first time that we have gotten obvious... Thank you, book. This may be the first time that we have gotten obvious Piper nipples showing through her shirt. I think we got one last episode. I think we did. Because I think I remember mentioning it. Okay, and I so think this you might... had it in your notes. Okay, so this might be the second time, but it was like legit. It's rare for sure. It is rare, but it was like legit, like the most blatant Piper nipples. 
Anyway, they cut back to Bane's office, and the clock on the wall, with a proper IV for four, yep. reads about 11.57. Yeah, about. And we can't really tell what it reads, because it's... It's at uh, an angle. It's yeah. shot at it's an at angle. It's at an angle, and it's like wrought iron, so yeah. it's a little hard to see. It's like black wrought iron. Black wrought iron on a dark red wall. It's orange. It's dark orange okay. walls. Yeah. But Barbus tells Bane that if Prue isn't back in one minute, he's going to spend his last two minutes killing him because he thinks it's, you know, Bane's fault that Hellfire didn't succeed because, you know, he fell in love with her and distracted her or whatever. But that's how we know that it's 1157 because Barbus is saying he got three minutes left. Prue then walks in and she's got the fur coat on again. Barbus asks if they're dead. She's like, they're right where they belong. And they walk in right behind her. Yeah. Barbus yells, kill them to Bane, who gets out a small silver gun points it at them, and Piper freezes them. Phoebe walks over to gaze at Bane as like, I see why you were having a hard time. I see what all this attraction to the dark side is about. Yeah. And Prue's like, hey, Pipes, can you maybe leave Barbus frozen but unfreeze Bane? Yeah. And Piper's like, well, I've never done that before, but I am fully willing to try. So she walks around to stand behind Bane, not facing Barbus. Yeah. And then as Phoebe after Phoebe takes the gun out of Bane's hand, Piper unfreezes him. And he is of course confused. So Prue makes him fly across the room into a door. But breaks nothing. Apparently. Yeah. And so then, it's a it's a hardy door that. Yes. And yeah. then because apparently all of that work took three fucking minutes, the clock starts to chime midnight. Yeah. Barbus unfreezes just as the clock chimes, though I did time it and from the beginning of this scene to the time he unfreezes was just over a minute. Yeah. So, just saying. Mm -hmm. But, so, he unfreezes, clock chimes, he starts screaming no, and then spins in a slow circle. He continues yelling, starts spinning faster, he gets engulfed in flames, and is vanquished in a puff of black smoke. Mm -hmm. Phoebe says that she never gets tired of kicking his butt, which was cute. Very. And then Piper gives her a hug from behind. Prue walks over to Bane, who is still against all Against all odds, still flirting with her. Yeah. He smiles, she smiles, Piper smirks, and we cut to an exterior dish out of the manor. Yep. So, it's been at least a day, but as we see Phoebe and Piper cleaning the windows in the wicker room, they are completely fixed. So, it may have been more than a day later. Or Dan was just being real on task. Possibly. Yeah. I think he probably, like, rushed his guys a little bit. Yeah, it's like, well, she's not going to move in with me, we might as well get this done. Yeah. Because, you know... So she'll be impressed with the speed of my crew. Yeah. Which anyway. is irreflective of my own speed, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> well, in some endeavors at least. <laughs> anyway. So Phoebe is now wearing a bright red top that has spaghetti straps and is tied in the middle of her back. So no bra. She has paired that with the skirt that is a darker red in the front with like stars all over and a brighter red and yellow on the back with red abstract flowers. It's odd, but not ugly, Mm -hmm. but it's definitely odd. Mm -hmm. She also has on a red necklace and two red flowers in her hair, because that's apparently her aesthetic this season. Piper is in a blue shirt with small triangle detail on the collar, gray pants, and a small necklace that looks like a little beaded T on a string. Mm -hmm. Her hair has thin feathers randomly placed throughout, which seem wrapped into strands of her hair. Yeah, they're like these spirals constraining little Mm -hmm. little locks of hair. It's very 90s. -hmm. Yeah. So we have a cute moment between Phoebe and Piper, and we find that Piper is not going to be moving in with Dan because she thinks it's way too soon for that. I agree, and I'm very proud of her. Mm Mm-hmm. Go Pipes. Yep. Prue then comes in wearing a very conservative dress for her. Yeah, she's looking comparatively dowdy. Yeah. It's a wrap style dress in shades of brownish tan with a and, swirly pattern on yeah, it. Yeah, and it's much less décolletage than we are used to seeing from Prue. Yeah. She has paired it with a couple of beaded bracelets and a beaded necklace with a little pendant thing hanging off the What's... middle of it. She is on the phone with Daryl, and we find that she has apparently given Marcy a ring as a thank you for protecting them. She liked it, so she put a ring on it. Uh Uh-huh. And she's saying that she can sell it and use the money to rebuild the bookstore. She hangs up and her sisters laugh a little because she had to assure Daryl that the ring wasn't stolen. Mm -hmm. Phoebe asks Prue what else Hellfire got from Bane, and Prue gets this look on her face. She kind of wistfully says, oh, you know, diamond necklaces, bracelets, a Hockney, and a Salvador Dali. 
before admitting that it wouldn't be right for her to keep any of it. Yeah. However, she she has figured out a way to use it for some good and save her job. And And then then she she qualifies the statement saying, you know what? And if I didn't save my job, I can always ask for project and job hunt twice as fast. Which, you know, Phoebe is still salty about this new ability to be in two places at once. Though, to be fair... Prim's actual body is doing nothing but standing prone while she astral projects, so it's not like she mm-hmm. can actually do two things at once. Well, you know, maybe while waiting for interviews, she could take a nap. <laughs> take a nap? That's well, not pretend exactly... to take it. Pretend to take a nap and astral project somewhere else. I don't mm-hmm. know. Maybe, but what I doubt it, but whatever. Yeah. Anyway, so the doorbell rings as Prue is saying that she may have learned a few things from Ms. Hellfire, like changing her routine a bit, and her sisters kind of laugh at her. Prue goes to answer the door to Jack, who is standing there. He is wearing a dark blue shirt with a slight v-neck under a leather jacket and gray pants. And he is incensed. He walks in uninvited and starts berating Prue for not answering her phone, coming to the office, or otherwise appearing to be doing her job. He's like, what do you have to say for yourself? And And she she stops and looks up and she goes, $275,000. Yeah. And he questions her and she says that it is the market value of the anonymous estate donation that she's been out acquiring, with one request that all of the proceeds go to the Stop the Violence Foundation. Which I thought was a nice touch. Yeah, so of course I had to look that up, right? So Stop the Violence is a real charity. They have branches all over the country. I'll put a link to the main foundation website on our website. But it should be noted that they have an interesting typo on the main page. The full name of the foundation is Stop the Violence, Increase the Peace. But the mission statement, as written on the main page of the website says, stop the violence, increase the violence. (laughs) And I don't know how it is that no one has noticed or been made aware of this typo. Did you email them? No, because their contact us just has asked for a name and address. There's no, like, field to say anything. I'm like, I don't have the time for this right now. But I thought it was very funny. Very, very funny. That is funny, and I wonder if that was just some rando hacker. No, I think it's just sincerely a typo and nobody's noticed it. But it doesn't matter. Anyway, there is also the Stop the Violence movement, which is different. It was formed by rapper KRS-One in 1987 as a response to violence in the hip-hop and African-American communities. I'm not sure if it's still active, but I'll put a link to that on the website. And I'll also link to KRS-One, because why not? So, Jack backpedals, and he's like, I never doubted you for a moment. Yeah, Prue calls him a liar, and then says that they should go celebrate. And he agrees, and so she grabs a tan jacket and they walk outside and she closes the door behind her and we go to the end credits Mm -hmm. yay so that brings us to our ratings portion of the evening would you like to go first sure wait no i went first last week you go first did you i'm pretty sure okay so i'm giving this episode a seven out of ten impractical pleather Fair enough. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10 wardrobe rating parties. Yeah. I still do think that it's interesting that she gave up everything, though part of me thinks that she didn't necessarily give up all that wardrobe. We'll have to check in future episodes. She's probably like, well, I know I've worn these, which probably decreases their value, so I might as well keep them. (laughs) Possibly. But yeah, we'll have to check in future episodes if she comes up with anything leather or faux fur and refer back to this. Mm -hmm. So speaking of outfits, that brings us to our outfit portion of the episode. So what was your favorite outfit or outfits? My favorite outfit was what Marcy was wearing. Really? Yeah. Wow. That and the first outfit we see Prue in, although I would not wear it to work. The corset thing? Yeah. You liked that? It was nice on her. It wasn't bad, but just not to work. Yeah, no, not to work. For me, I, I'll i admit, I actually enjoyed everything that Prue wore in this episode. Oh, yeah. It was but... Good, it was a good outfit up. It really was. Like, and it... Because she's got the body to pull it off. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the biggest thing. But I think I have to go with the final dress that she wore. It was much more casual, and it looks like she could actually breathe properly while wearing it. So there's that. For Piper, I think that her final outfit was okay. But I really think that I liked it the most because I liked her hair with the feathers in it. It was cute. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And for Phoebe, I liked the outfit that she was wearing for most of the show, minus the jacket. Yeah. Yeah. But that's it. 
we're done mm. for another and for, episode. For Phoebe, I really like when she does that thing with her hair, like at the end. Yeah, with, with the, the little flowers, flowers in, it. in it. Yeah, it was cute. Mm-hmm. But so we're done for another episode. Yeah, we have finished. So we are now into social media time. Mm-hmm. So. As per always, you can find us at charmchats.com. You can email us at charmchats at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter and Tumblr at charmchatspod. And you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Patreon at charmchats. We would also like it very much if you would rate and review us on iTunes. Right now we have, I believe, 11 reviews with a 4.5 star rating. And I'm very, very humbled by that. Thank you all so much it is it is lovely it's to know that people so nice. like us yeah you like us you, you really, really really like us yeah it's just it's really cool to be like that's right i have a podcast with a 4.5 rating on itunes like you know there's only 11 reviews but still yeah <laughs> there's 11 reviews there's i think the last reviews. time we checked there were nine five nine last time i checked before last... sending you the snapshot there were five which was months ago. Yeah, and the last time I checked, there were nine. So, mm-hmm. and now there's eleven, and that makes me very, very happy. Yeah. So, speaking of our Patreon, we have a brand new patron. So, we would like to give a lovely shout out to Corey Vargas. Thank you, Corey. Thank you very much with the five dollar reward. Oh yeah. Woo-hoo! And we will be sending you a thank you card in the mail, signed by both point. of us. Hopefully we can time it so that it coincides with this episode. Oh, well, if I have a thank you card in that right there, Mm -hmm. I will send it out, like, tomorrow. Oh, okay. So he's going to get it long before. Yeah, he'll he'll get the thank you card long before he hears his thank you. Because that's just the way time works. Mm, Time is a flat circle. Wibbly wobbly. Dimey wimey. Stuff. Anyway, so, again, thank you all very very much all of our patreon supporters of which we now have five which is so cool Mm -hmm. so excited thank you thank you thank you so much lou says thank you yes the sump pump says thank you Uh uh-huh the heater does not say thank you the heater is currently asleep thank you to the heater for being asleep Mm -hmm. so that's us done for another week for another episode Mm -hmm. so until next time sleep tight don't let the warlocks bite Bye! Phoebe, Piper and Pooh, they've got evil to slay and some potions to brew. So we'll see where it's at this week with Kendra and Kat.